I want to welcome all. I want to welcome all of you to NAMI Westside LA's Wellness Weekend, and our featured speaker, the illustrious, famous Dr. Xavier Amador, who has written the Bible for NAMI members across the nation, how to communicate, how to speak to your ill relative, and he has taught all of us that we can coax our mentally ill relatives into treatment by being their friend rather than by being an authority figure. And Dr. Amador teaches the LEAP method of communication, which is listen, empathize, agree, and partner. And he will explain to us in this next hour and a half uh, why it's important we reflect back delusions and hallucinations and not argue with our relatives. Um, how, how do we delay giving our opinion? Our relatives don't need to give our opinion on everything or advice with us. And uh, the importance of apologizing, even though you don't think you did anything wrong, uh, to apologize for not getting what they're talking about, for disappointing our relative in some ways, so in other words, to make ourselves available and vulnerable and good listener. This is what Dr. Armador teaches us. And it's my greatest honor to introduce this incredible author and mental health advocate, Dr. Xavier Armador. Sharon, thank you very much. It's my assistant asking why I'm not in NAMI West LA. So whoever uh, contacted him, please let Jason know. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for the really kind introduction. Uh, uh, I was going to add, well, I'll add a couple of things in just a moment to, to your introduction, but it's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I have a lot of connections to West LA and, and it's, it's good to be back if, if only virtually, uh, maybe in person sometime soon. Uh, but why don't we get started and I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to start by sharing here a little bit and Put some slides up and we'll get started. And somebody asked me if it was okay to record. I'm, I am fine with that. I'm sorry I didn't chat back fast enough. So I'm not sick, I don't need help. Um, this is something I've heard, you know, I, I was trying to count the number of years that I've been in the field. Uh, first as a psychiatric aide and an inpatient unit working with the mobile acute crisis team then getting my PhD, working at Columbia University, being a psychologist, working on inpatient units, emergency rooms. And I've heard uh, many, many people with serious mental illness utter these words to me. I'm not, I'm not sick, you know, and oftentimes I'd hear, you're the crazy one, not me. Uh, I don't need help, I don't need treatment. Um, I'm gonna tell you uh, about the first time I heard this phrase uh, back when I was 21. But I want to really focus this afternoon on, on LEAP. On, and Sharon did a really nice uh, summary of the LEAP approach. Uh, it's seven communication tools that are, that are designed to engage somebody who doesn't understand they have a mental illness, uh, engage them and get their cooperation and agreement to enter treatment. That's the whole focus of the LEAP uh, approach. So, when did I first hear, I'm not sick, I don't need help? Uh, it happened in the context of my relationship with my brother, Henry. This is a picture of, of Henry and myself. Uh, we had just immigrated with our mother from Cuba. Our father had been uh, killed in the revolution. And it was a very traumatic time for our family. Um, that's me driving the car. And that's my brother, Henry, looking in the window. And if you, can, if you have a big enough screen, you can see the big smile on his face. Um, I'd like to think he was smiling because he was... Uh, hanging out with his little brother. And I'm probably right, uh, because we were really close. We really enjoyed each other. We, um, we listened to each other. We uh, got each other through this very difficult period of time where our mother had asked for political asylum. We, we arrived with really nothing uh, and started our life uh, in the United States together. Uh, Henry was uh, because our father had, had died in the, in the Cuban Revolution, Henry was, in many respects, also a father figure to me. Although, ultimately, we were just really, really good friends, um, despite the age difference. Fast forward from this picture, which was taken in the early 1960s, to um, 
1981. It was December of 81. And I was in New York studying psychology as an undergraduate. Henry was living in Tucson, Arizona with my mother and my stepfather. My mom had remarried a wonderful, wonderful man who I call dad. And Henry called me and he said, Javier, uh, I picked up, pick up the phone and Henry says, Javier, I killed dad. You got to come home. And he hung up the phone. Um, you know, I, I didn't think it was possible that my kind, gentle, a uh, sweet older brother could possibly have been violent. And it turns out he wasn't. Um, I got him back on the phone. It took me an hour or so. And as I was talking to him on the phone, he started describing a delusion. He said that he had been playing the guitar and that the music had been transmitted into our stepfather's head, causing him to trip and fall while out jogging. And that's how he died. So I knew something was, was very different about Henry just with that one phone call. I flew to Arizona and I was there with all my siblings and it was clear that Henry had a number of, of delusions, including delusions about the devil uh, and was hearing voices. He had auditory hallucinations. My siblings all gathered, I remember this like it was yesterday, we were all gathered in, a, uh, in the living room of our parents' house and one by one, they pointed to me literally and verbally and said, you deal with Henry. You're the psych psychologist. Now, any of you who have studied psychology uh, as an undergraduate know that you're not a psychologist at that point. Um, I think the reason they asked me or they strongly encouraged me to try and help Henry accept treatment uh, was because they knew how close we were. Again, look at this picture and you, you get a sense of, of the closeness these two brothers had and the two of us had. So I went and I talked with Henry and I said, you know, you're hearing voices. You've got these strange ideas that you killed our father. It's not true. Um, uh, you know, you really need help. And this went on for seven days, this back and forth debate about whether or not he was mentally ill, whether or not he'd benefit from seeing a psychiatrist. I, um, uh, was first gentle and then I became more insistent. I got frustrated. Um, I uh, got a little bit into tough love with him during those seven days of debate. And in the end, I got him to the hospital like so many of us do by calling 911. Now, back then in 1981 in Tucson, Arizona, we didn't have crisis teams, but I was very fortunate that the police officers that, that uh, responded to the call uh, met me in the front yard. I explained my brother's mentally ill. He needs help. Our stepfather had just passed away. You know, please be gentle. I don't know what I said, but it was along those lines. They were great. Uh, they got him into a, a county hospital. He got treatment. And within really just maybe two weeks, uh, the voices were completely gone. The hallucinations resolved with treatment with medication. And the delusions became very muted. He wasn't talking about them. He wasn't sure if they were really true. He, he did understand that he hadn't killed our father. And I thought, this is a miracle drug, um, the medication he was taking. Um, two weeks later, and I try to imagine a one month hospitalization, which today is really hard to get. Sometimes it's hard to get more than a few days. Uh, but after a month in the hospital, I was at a family meeting with the psychiatrist, the psych social worker, the nurse, his nurse. And it was explained to him that, you know, Henry, you have schizophrenia, you need to take this medicine and you need to take it for the rest of your life. Henry nodded, said, yes, okay, I understand. We go home. We go back to my, my mother's house. That night, where do you think I found his, his bottle of antipsychotic medication? can't talk to me right now, but I, I know that many or most of you are, are thinking that I found it in the garbage can, and that's exactly where I found it. Uh, I picked up the bottle, I, I knocked on his door, and I said, what's going on? And he, and he said, I don't need that. And I said, Henry, j just hours ago in the hospital, you said you understood you have schizophrenia and you need to take this medicine for the rest of your life. Uh, he said, well, that was then. This, you know, I don't need it anymore. I was having some difficulties before. This started a seven year, um, really the only word that, that really captures 
our interaction is battle. This started a seven year battle during which our relationship looked like this picture. You know, Henry running away from me, running away from psychiatrists, from social workers who were trying to help him, uh, running away from anybody who said, you've got a problem, you've got a mental illness and you'd benefit from treatment. He wanted nothing to do with that. During this seven year period that this picture symbolizes of Henry running away from people, he was homeless for a while. He had up to four hospitalizations every year, most of them involuntary, and um, he didn't get treatment. I mean, seven years, we're talking close to 30 hospitalizations in and out of the revolving door. He would get treated, get stabilized, be discharged, stop taking the medication because he was certain nothing was wrong. Now, during that same seven year period, I was studying to actually become a psychologist. And I ran into patients just like Henry. And there was one woman in particular I worked with uh, on an inpatient unit who said all the same things. I'm not sick, I don't need help. Um, I just need to get out of the hospital. And I was really frustrated with her. I was a psychology intern. And I went and I talked with my supervisor. And as I was telling him the story of what she was saying and what I was saying and how I was trying to explain to her that she was mentally ill and she needed treatment, my supervisor put his hand up and said, stop. He just said, stop talking. So I stopped talking. <laughs> and then he said, no, no, you don't understand. I want you to stop talking to her. Stop telling her what she needs to do. Start listening. Start leading with your ear, not with your mouth. And ask her what she wants and join with her on her goals. Uh, kind of simple advice, but it really quickly, when I went back out to speak with her, turned everything around. I started listening. I started reflecting back what you want is to get out of the hospital. You want your mother to stop calling the police on you. You want a job, is that right? You know, she was telling me these things. She wanted a boyfriend. And I was able to partner with her on, on those four goals. And with that, she accepted medication. She worked with me as an outpatient. Um, that's just one success story. The, the main point in me telling you this story before we continue is that I had an epiphany. I, I realized that what I'd been doing with my brother for these seven years, during which he was running away from us, uh, was, was, was wrong. It was, it was you know, intuitive to try to educate him and ask him to get help but it, it had the exact opposite result. It got him angry, it got him more paranoid about me and it, and, it, and it drove him away from treatment. So I called Henry on the phone. Uh, he was still in Arizona, I was in New York and I called him and I said, I wanna apologize for all the times I told you you were mentally ill and that you needed treatment. And then I made him a promise. I said, I promise I'll never again tell you that you're mentally ill and need treatment. And I kept that promise. I, I never again told him that he was mentally ill and needed treatment. Um, within, without getting into all the details, uh, within six months, and for those of you who have read, I'm not sick, I don't need help, uh, you know the details. Uh, within six months, maybe, maybe it was a little bit less than that, he accepted treatment. He accepted a long acting injectable medication. And for 18 years, our relationship looked like this. This is a picture of Henry. He's the taller one. I'm the one with the Jerry Seinfeld haircut. And if you look at his hands and the smile on his face, that I think that, that tells you all you need to know about how we got our relationship back uh, in the way that he was holding me and we were holding each other. Um, the paranoia was gone. The anger was gone. Both of us were no longer angry. And um, importantly, he stayed on medication for the next 18 years of his life. Uh, he was in the hospital once for one day, and it was a truly a voluntary hospitalization, only once in 18 years. Uh, he went to a clubhouse to hang out with those mentally ill people, he called them. They, they were his friends, is what he called them. But he didn't see himself as a mentally ill person. He accepted treatment, long-acting injectable medication, for 18 years, not because he thought he had an illness. He was very clear about it. He said he accepted the treatment for me and for two other people who were really helpful to him. Uh, he called them mom and pops. That's how much, that's how close he felt to them. 
Uh, so he accepted treatment because of his relationships with three people. Uh, my brother uh, passed away, not from his illness. Uh, he, he passed away uh, in a traffic accident. He was actually being a good Samaritan and, and, and unfortunately and tragically got hit uh, by a car driven by a man who was not being uh, careful or compliant with his insulin injections. He had diabetes. Um, but my main point in telling you about his passing is, is that uh, I believe if he were still here today, he would still be in treatment. Uh, and, 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 and by the way, he also had a girlfriend. <laughs> um, I'm just remembering talking to her after his death. Um, he had two volunteer jobs. He had a meaningful life in recovery. So I, I had this very profound experience when I was 21, uh, 29, getting my PhD of a transformation, not only in relationships, but in helping somebody I love very much accept treatment. So real quickly, we, we hear about people in, in, the, in the media, in the press who have serious mental illness, but unfortunately when we hear about them, you know, the headlines are all about uh, those rare instances when people with untreated mental illness commit crimes. And we hear that rather than stories of recovery. Uh, this is one story I'll, I'll, I'll just touch on very briefly. This is a picture of Margaret Mary Ray. Um, and most of you probably don't know who she is or who she was. She was known as uh, David Letterman's stalker. Uh, so this is somebody who is a, is a very good example of, of someone who is um, seriously mentally ill and ended up getting criminalized. In other words, she got arrested for showing up at his, his home, his mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, you know, she, she walked in and was waiting for her husband to come home. She had the delusion. She was married to Deb David Letterman. And as most of you know, a delusion is a fixed false belief. You can't talk somebody out of it. Uh, and when Letterman came home, he called 911. They arrested her. She was brought before a judge and she got probation. She got time in jail. She never got treatment. Uh, that was, this is before we had mental health diversion courts. Uh, Margaret Mary Ray um, had schizoaffective disorder, um, I believe she was David Letterman's uh, spouse, his wife for a long, many, many years and never got reliable, consistent treatment. So this is a, a story of, of how someone with mental illness that's untreated can end up in our criminal justice system. So here's a question I'm gonna ask you to think about. Denial impairs common sense judgment about the need for treatment and services, right? If you don't understand you're ill, it impairs common sense judgment about the need for treatment. Would you agree with that? I'm guessing all of you are agreeing with that, or most of you. Um, I actually don't agree with that. If I take the perspective of my brother Henry, or Margaret Mary Ray, who I just told you about, or roughly 6 million Americans with serious mental illness who do not understand they're ill, they have what we used to call denial. If I take their perspective, it's common sense to refuse treatment. And, and let me put it a different way. How many of you would inject yourselves with insulin if you did not have diabetes, if you were sure you did not have diabetes? Would you? I'm sure the answer is no, you wouldn't. And, and the reason, the first reason is because I don't have diabetes. The second reason is it could hurt you. And I've heard this many times from countless patients I've worked with and clients, consumers, that uh, uh, they don't wanna take the medication, it's just bad for them. And what, most importantly, they don't need it. But are we dealing with uh, denial? We're not in most instances. In, in the majority of cases, we're dealing with a, a neurocognitive symptom called anosognosia. This was first described by uh, a neurologist in uh, 1919, so 102 years ago now. Uh, his name was Babinski. Uh, anyone who's had a, a, a baby might know about the APGAR score, and one of the items is the Babinski reflex. Um, uh, he, the, other, the other discovery besides the Babinski reflex 
uh, that is um, that he's um, known for is describing anastignosia. And this, uh, the classic examples of this would be people who following stroke or other kinds of brain injury would be paralyzed, but they didn't know it. Their unawareness, it wasn't denial of paralysis. It was complete blindness to their, to their paralysis, unawareness. It was so uh, severe that they would try to get up out of bed and then fall down because they were, their leg was paralyzed. Uh, I've, I've actually evaluated patients like this when I did a year on a neurology service and I it was really profoundly, um, it was very profound to see how severe the unawareness of neurological deficits could be. And it was during that year that I also had this kind of another epiphany, frankly, I thought, boy, this is exactly like what happened with my brother and so many people with serious mental illness I've worked with. There's all this evidence surrounding them, you know, all around them that they're mentally ill. They've maybe been hospitalized. They've been told they're mentally ill. They, they have unusual experiences like delusions, hallucinations, and so on. And they're as blind to that brain disorder as these stroke patients with paralysis were blind to their uh, paralysis, to the neurological disorders. Um, I think it's real important to know how to pronounce this word. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little, a little trick because if you're talking with a psychiatrist or, or a therapist who's working with your loved one and they don't know, they keep thinking your loved one just needs to develop insight. Um, it's really useful to be able to ask them, do you know about anasygnosia? So I'm going to invite you, wherever you are, uh, on the count of three to say this out loud. And, uh, and you can use my, my little mnemonic trick here. One, two, three. Anosegnosia. Anosegnosia. Um, I hope you, you uh, participated in that little exercise. Uh, but it is really useful and I would argue important to be able to pronounce uh, this symptom of mental illness. Now I'm calling it a symptom. I'm going to summarize in just two, three minutes research on anosognosia in people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, this is a, a slide of the DSM-5. The, the DSM is the diagnostic manual we use for uh, making psychiatric diagnoses. It's the authoritative manual on psychiatric diagnoses. All psychiatrists have this, psychologists, social workers, nurses. We all use it. Um, I was asked to submit uh, text that reflected the research on you know, poor insight or what people used to call denial. And this was vetted, this was discussed and, and, and vetted by the work group in charge of revising the, the DSM which again is our diagnostic manual. And here's what it says. It says that unawareness of illness, not denial, unawareness of illness is typically a symptom, a symptom, a symptom of the illness, not a coping strategy. And, and what, what's an example of a coping strategy? Well, denial, right? It's not that. It's comparable to the lack of awareness of neurological deficits following brain injury termed what? You might want to try to say it with me. Anasygnosia. So unawareness of illness is typically a symptom called anasygnosia. That's what's in our diagnostic manual for mental disorders. And, and still so many uh, mental health professionals that you're encountering don't even know about this. Uh, but you can point them to the purple book uh, that, that I have a picture of up there and, uh, and ask them uh, to have a look at page, I believe it's 101, uh, and, and, and read this description. What, what else is there? This symptom of unawareness of illness, like my brother had, and Margaret Mary Ray had, and, and I, I suspect many, many of your relatives have, this symptom is the most common predictor of somebody refusing treatment, not adherence to treatment is the term. Refusing treatment, or if they accept it, uh, dropping out of treatment, stopping without telling anybody. It's the most common predictor. 
Um, it also predicts other things. Anastagnosia also predicts higher relapse rates, more involuntary hospitalizations, poor psychosocial functioning. What does that mean? The ability to work, the ability to form intimate relationships, relationships with family members also has been measured, uh, the ability to go back to school. So if you have anastagnosia, recovery really is what the DSM is saying, is much, much harder to achieve, if not impossible. Um, I don't believe it's impossible, and that's why we're going to get into the LEAP approach. Um, it also predicts uh, an increase in aggression, which kind of makes sense to me. If people keep telling me, Javier, you're mentally ill, you're mentally ill, and I'm certain I'm not, I'm going to start getting angry, uh, maybe paranoid, uh, certainly upset, and, and maybe a little aggressive. Um, it also predicts a poor course of illness, uh, and, and that's measured in a number of different ways. So told you about anastagnosia. Um, some of you uh, have read about it in, in the book that Sharon mentioned, which I don't think is a Bible, by the way, but, but I'll take the compliment. Um, the I'm not sick, I don't need help book. Uh, so you know about anastagnosia, and if you didn't, I've just told you a bit about it just now. Um, how you talk about it really matters a lot because it, it, it reveals how you're thinking about the problem you're dealing with in your loved one uh, who doesn't understand he or she is ill. So I would strongly encourage you to not say things like, she doesn't accept she has a mental illness because that suggests it's a decision that you know deep down inside, she knows she's mentally ill, but she's just not going to accept it. Uh, don't say things like refuses to acknowledge he has schizophrenia. Um, I used to say that to my brother during those seven years that we argued, you know, well, why do you refuse to admit and acknowledge that you have mental illness? You know, it's obvious that you've got this problem. Denies she has mental illness. She has bipolar disorder. I would encourage you not to, to use those terms. Doesn't admit, won't admit, refuses to admit. All those, all those phrases, uh, when we use them, even when we use them just talking with other loved ones who don't have mental illness, uh, we're reinforcing the idea that the person can be convinced they're mentally ill. And uh, what the research shows is that the level of unawareness, the symptom of anastagnosia, is stable over time. In other words, it doesn't improve almost always, not always, but almost always, it doesn't improve with treatment, with antipsychotic medication. So hallucinations improve, delusions can improve, just like happened with my brother, but his anisognosia did not improve. He never ever believed he was mentally ill, yet he accepted treatment. And that's where we're headed. When you talk about anisognosia, um, and again, I think language really matters, I would encourage you to say things like, uh, she cannot comprehend she has a mental illness or he's unaware that he has this mental illness. Unaware, not denial, not refusing, but unaware, unable to see or understand she has a mental illness. Or my preference is you say has anisognosia for mental illness, just like you would say somebody has auditory hallucinations or my loved one has delusions about me. You could also say, and has anisognosia for the mental illness. Doesn't understand that, that he's mentally ill. So real quickly, what about awareness of illness and treatment? Well, awareness of being ill, being aware that you have an illness is among the top two predictors of long-term medication adherence. My brother's a perfect example uh, of, of Actually, he's not a perfect example of this. I'll, I'll bring him up in a second. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a perfect example. Uh, I uh, was diagnosed decades ago with major depressive disorder. I take medication because I'm aware that I have this mental illness. So I accept treatment. I've been in cognitive therapy. Uh, I've taken medication. I'm one of those people who, because he's aware of, of having a mental dis disorder, accepts treatment and stays in it. So what's the other top predictor, do you think? 
let's pause for a moment. What else would predict someone accepting treatment and staying in treatment for, for years and, and decades? Now, some of you might be thinking side effects, the experience of side effects, because that's what our loved ones tell us. I don't wanna take the medication because of the side effects. That is not the reason. Uh, the research is very clear that side effects and, and neg negative experience with side effects doesn't predict uh, whether somebody will refuse treatment. Now, side effects are important. Don't, don't misunderstand me. We, we need to address them, but they don't predict refusal of, of medication. Um, some of you may be thinking, well, supportive re relationships predict uh, you know, some, somebody's willingness to accept treatment. Um, I was very supportive of my brother during those seven years. We, we argued, we debated, but I told him I loved him. I told him you know, that my advice that he get help was based solely on my love for him. I was very supportive, but that didn't work. You know, that, that led to his running away from me because I, I persisted in trying to educate him about his mental illness, trying to convince him that he was mentally ill. The research, and there's been a lot of research on this, um, uh, focused on therapeutic alliance, on, on professionals working with people with anastignosia, shows that it is a relationship, not simply a supportive relationship, but a very specific relationship with someone uh, that can predict that person's willingness to accept treatment. It's somebody who listens to you without judgment. So when you say you're not mentally ill, I don't, I don't counter that with evidence that they are mentally ill. I don't judge it. So it's, it's an active form of listening. Um, the person respects the point of view of the mentally ill person. So, uh, you know, when my brother said that he had killed our father, uh, had I known what to do, you know, back in 1981, I probably would have gotten a lot further, a lot faster instead of stumbling around for seven years arguing with him. Uh, I told him, oh, Henry, you didn't kill dad. Obviously, you didn't kill dad. I didn't engage with him and listen to him and respect his point of view. Now, obviously, I don't want to pretend to believe that he did that. Uh, and we're going to get into that as we get into the LEAP tools, how, how you can honestly respect somebody's point of view, even when you don't agree with it. The third element of this relationship that leads to acceptance of treatment is that I, the person says, I'd like to see you try treatment. Now notice the wording. It isn't, it isn't um, I believe you really need treatment. Again, that's getting educational and it, getting educational gets the person to run away from us. It's simply a statement of what I would like. What I would like is for you to try the treatment, to try the medication. So listening without judgment, respecting the other person's point of view, and then you do have an opinion, but you give it hum with humility. You don't say you need medication, you know. Uh, you say things like, I'd like you to try this. So what do we know? You know, I just sort of give you a summary of research on how we can engage people who don't understand they're mentally ill, how, how we can engage them in treatment. Uh, what do we know about unawareness of illness and acceptance of treatment? We don't win on the strength of our argument, of our education, of our evidence that the person is mentally ill. We don't win on that. We win on the strength of our relationship, a non-judgmental, respectful relationship. So I've, talked a bit about how we can just a, an introduction to how we can engage people in treatment. And I talked quite a bit about anosognosia and, and, and let's circle back to anosognosia and um, see if we can have an experience together of, of what it feels like to have the symptom of serious mental illness. So we're gonna need a volunteer. Uh, if you look from left to right, uh, I need you to have a webcam so that we can Turn on your camera and we can see you. And this is very important. Please, please pay special close attention. <laughs> to volunteer for this role play, uh, I would like you to be married and to be currently working. So you have a job right now and you're married and living with your spouse. Okay? 
So if you'd like to volunteer and, and role play with me, uh, and, and please, if you've seen me do this role play, don't volunteer. I, I like somebody who's never seen it before. Uh, click on reactions and then raise your hand and Elizabeth is gonna choose somebody at random. Uh, so Elizabeth, you're, you're on. And I will stop sharing my screen, I think, so that you can put my face and our volunteers face up. Great, I have brought Colleen on. Okay, great. Colleen, can we, can you unmute yourself? The little red microphone button? I think most of us are used to Zoom. Do you want me to start the video as well? That'd be great if I could see you. Yeah, I would be grateful. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. You're very welcome. And thank you for uh, agreeing to help me out. Um, what, what is your spouse's name? Mike. Mike, and how long have you been together? 41 years. 41 years. And you're working, right? Yes, yeah. I am. A, I'm a counselor. You're a counselor. What's the first name of your supervisor, the person you work for? Uh, Ed. Ed, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I forgot um, that his name was Ed. And, and I should explain to the group and, and to you that... Um, what I'm going to do right now is attempt to help you. Uh, and this is not LEAP. Ed asked me to, to help you because he knew you were attending this, this seminar and he knew the title was I'm not sick, I don't need help. Ed believes that you do have a, an illness, a mental illness. And he's asked me to, to intervene with you and to see if I could help you decide to get some, some treatment. And the reason for this uh, is because, uh, you know, and this is going to sound, I'm sure, very far-fetched to you. Um, Mike is, is not your husband. Uh, Mike is, is married to, to Susan. That's his wife. They have three children together. Uh, I know you believe you're married to Mike, right? Yes. Yeah. For 41 years. Yes. Yeah. But actually, you're not. Um, Ed has, um, has put you on a medical leave of absence pending a, an evaluation by a psychiatrist. Um, what do you think about that? Is that something you'd be willing to do? Go get evaluated for this, this delusion that you have that you're, you're married to Mike. You can't return to work until and your clients have all been informed and they're, they're gonna be seeing somebody else that you're, you're out on a medical leave of absence. They don't know the details. Uh, it, 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 it's happening as of tomorrow morning, as of Monday morning. Um, you can return to work if you get a psychiatric evaluation and, and ultimately uh, Ed would like to see you get treatment because apparently there's a, a number of restraining orders. I have them copies of them right here with me uh, that Mike has gotten, Mike and Susan both have gotten because you keep showing up at their house. My, well, anyway, there's more detail I have, but what, what do you think about going to see a psychiatrist? Because we've arranged for somebody who will see you today on a Sunday. It's an, it's an emergency room psychiatrist, but, but he's willing. Well, I'm shocked and I'm scared okay. and, my, and, mm -hmm. well, my question is, would you be willing to stand up, go outside? Uh, we've called the crisis team, the mobile acute crisis team. They're out front and they're willing to talk to you and take you to the hospital to get evaluated. Uh, Ed moved heaven and earth to make this happen. And I'm right on time. He asked me to do this at 20 till the hour. I trust him, so I would say yes. Really? I would. Okay, so you go to an emergency room for a delusion that you're married to Mike. Is that what you're saying you do? Just to prove, to prove that this is incorrect. Okay, so you are evaluated by a psychiatrist, a nurse takes your vital signs, and the psychiatrist gets copies of the restraining orders, 
you tell the psychiatrist that you're married to Mike, right? Yes. For 41 years. The psychiatrist decides uh, this is a delusion. It's an erotomanic delusion and uh, tells you, uh, Colleen, uh, we've got a bed available for you upstairs. We'd like to admit you to our psychiatric inpatient unit. What would you like to do? You're not, Colleen, you're not a danger to yourself or others. So you're free to go. But we'd really recommend that you come up to the, I'm the psychiatrist right now. I'd really recommend that you come up to our, to our unit and, and accept some treatment there, some medication for your delusion that you're, you're married to Mike. What would you like to do? I've got a lot of other patients waiting for me and, and I, I just need to know if you're gonna accept our offer. No. Okay, well, I wish you the best of luck. If you change your mind, you know where we are. I can't promise a bed will be available, but, but there is one today. If you change your mind today, we could probably admit you. So, so the doctor shakes your hand, you walk out and where do you go? You go home? Yes. Okay. You can't get in. The door is locked. Mike's wife, Susan, calls the mobile acute crisis team. They show up. The police are there with them. Uh, and uh, they uh, take you into custody. And they bring you to the same psychiatric emergency room. It's a different psychiatrist now. And you get the same information. What do you do? Do you go to the psychiatric inpatient unit? Or do you say... Because again, you haven't threatened to kill anyone or hurt anybody. You're not threatening suicide. They can't hold you against your will. Mm. Oh, wait, they, I, just got a, they just got a phone call from, from Mike and his wife. They've insisted that, that you keep criminally trespassing and that they're gonna bring charges against you. So the psychiatrist says, you know what, Colleen, we're gonna put you on a 72 hour hold. We're going to involuntarily admit you for just 72 hours. So you're brought up to the psychiatric inpatient unit. They relieve you of your of your per, you know your personal belongings. Get your vital signs taken. It's later tonight, and a nurse comes up to you, and he's got a little cup, and in it are some pills, and he points to them and says, "This is an antipsychotic. This is for the side effects." Tries to hand you the the little cup of pills. Do you take it? No. So you're refusing. Mm-hmm. All right, and so now I, I'm suspicious. Okay. I'm going to ask you about your feelings in, in just a, a moment. Um, you go to bed that, that night in the inpatient unit. The next morning, they offer you medication again. Do you, do you refuse again? Yes. All right. So they let you go after 72 hours. They discharge you. All right. Do you, where do you go? Do you go home? I try. Okay. Same thing happens, only this time they call the police and they say that, that this woman is criminally trespassing and stalking us. The police bring you uh, to a mental health diversion court. I'm the judge. Uh, Ms. Ecker, I'm, I'm really sorry to see you here. I have a number of restraining orders in front of me. Uh, you've been charged with criminally trespassing uh, as well as violating a restraining order. I'm going to give you a choice. We can either, uh, you can post bail and we'll arraign you and, and go to trial on Friday for criminal trespassing and, and violation of restraining order. Or if you agree, you could go to the hospital. We've arranged for you to go to a psychiatric hospital to get evaluated and treated. And 30 days from now, I'll ask for a report from your treating psychiatrist. And there's a chance I can expunge these charges. What would you like to do, ma'am? go to the hospital to prove that this is all incorrect. Okay. So you go to the hospital, same thing happens. You're offered medication. Do you take it? No. So you refuse and the psychiatrist explains to you because you're refusing, I have to inform the judge, the police come, they arrest you, they take you into custody and they can do that on an inpatient unit. They bring you back before the judge. The judge says the same things to you. I'm going to give you one more chance to get treatment because you, because ma'am, I want you to stop harassing these people and, and violating these restraining orders. Or we can go to trial and, and what would you like to do? Comply. I'm fine. Well, I'm fine is not an answer, ma'am. I need an answer. Hospital or we go to Apply. trial? Comply. 
comply. So you're going to go to the hospital? Yes. All right. So you're back in the hospital. You're offered medication again. What do you do? Cheek it. So you pretend to take it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this cycle goes on, Colleen, for the next six months. Every time you try to text Mike, call Mike, go to his house, you end up in the criminal justice system. You end up in, in hospital in the psychiatric, involuntary psychiatric healthcare system. After six months, do you think you'd finally understand you're not married to Mike and you never were? No. What if this goes on for two years? You never see Mike. Do you have kids together? Do you believe you have kids together? Yes, four sons. You, so you believe you have four sons. And for two years, you have no contact with those four sons because they also call the police because they have restraining orders because their parents, Susan and Mike, have, have warned them about you. And you've got a delusion about them as well. So after two years of not being able to contact Mike, this man you believe you're married to, and these four young men who you are certain are your sons, but they're not, after, well, that's what the, the world is saying to you, that they're not. After two years, would you finally understand that you're not married to Mike and these are not your boys? No. Five years. No contact. Okay. No. That, that's what anisognosia for mental illness is like. The belief is unshakable. No matter how much evidence, no matter how much involvement of police, psychiatrists, you talk to other family members, they also tell you you're delusional, that you're not married to Mike. Maybe you talk to a, a, a close friend. No matter how much you hear this, it doesn't change your belief, right? Now, now I'm gonna ask you, since you started to offer um, what it felt like, what, what kind of feelings did you have, if any, even though this was a role play? Tremendous fear. Um, and, and, and also I felt unsafe and scared and my heart was, was swelling. Your heart was swelling. You felt fear and, and scared. Anything mm -hmm. else? Helpless. Hopeless. H helpless. You... Oh, helpless. 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 Unheard. I'm just writing down your your feelings. Imagining that that five for five years you have no contact with Mike or or your sons. Did you feel any? What would you feel? Lonely. Lonely. Anything else before I Discon let you go? Disconnected. Disconnected. And 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 lonely. Mm -hmm. What about an emotion connected with loneliness? What's the feeling? Tremendous sorrow and sadness. And sadness. Mm -hmm. Colleen, thank you for <laughs> participating in this. As soon as we're done, go give Mike a hug. All right. Thank you. Because Mike is your husband and, and your four yeah. boys as well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. You've really been really helpful. And, thank you. All right. Thank you. And Elizabeth, I'm going to share my screen again. Sounds good. And thank you, Colleen. Thank you. If I can find my cursor, which always disappears on me. There it is. So when working with somebody like I was with, with Colleen, and you can see my slides, right, Elizabeth? Yes. Okay. So when dealing with this symptom of anisognosia for mental illness, the, 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 the father, the mother, the police officer, the judge, or the doctor knows what's best for you. That approach doesn't work because there's no collaboration. Colleen and I are, can't collaborate because she knows she's married to Mike and has four sons together, but everybody is telling, I'm telling her she's not. So I can't expect her to be grateful for my diagnosis that she's delusional about Mike. I can't expect, expect her to be receptive to that. I can't expect her to be adherent. In other words, to accept medication. What I can expect is, is frustration, anger, hostility, fear. She talked about fear. She talked about loneliness and depression and isolation. And look, the, those feelings are already up here. And, and you know, how was I able to get those feelings on this slide before I heard them from Colleen. And Colleen wasn't a plant. She, 
as far as I know, she didn't know what was going to happen. Because these feelings are really common uh, in, in, in my work with people with anisognosia, anisognosia for mental illness. Uh, these are some of the loneliest people I've ever encountered and, and fearful, very fearful and, and often angry because everybody's telling them they're mentally ill. The last bullet point on what I can expect, what I do expect is overt and secretive noncompliance. So Colleen sure enough said she'd refuse the medication, overtly says no. And then later when pushed into it further by this imaginary judge that I created, she said, I'll cheek the meds. And for those of you who don't know what cheeking is, it means putting the pill in your cheek and you open your mouth to show that you've taken the pill, but you actually haven't and then you spit it out. So that's secretive noncompliance. So let's talk about LEAP. Let's, let's talk about some solutions. Um, LEAP stands for listen reflectively. I'm gonna get you, dive into that with you in just a moment. Empathize very strategically around certain feelings. Look for areas where you agree and partner on those areas. And then you also wanna delay giving your opinion that the person's mentally ill, that they need treatment and other uh, opinions. For example, let's say Colleen asked me, do I think she's married to Mike? Um, I wanna delay giving that opinion because when I give that opinion and if I say to her, I don't think you're married to Mike, I've already lost her. I've lost the, the respectful, non-judgmental relationship I'm trying to build. When I give my opinion, I give it in a humble way and uh, you, you see in parentheses three A's, I'll explain what those are in just a moment. And we look for uh, opportunities. They're actually opportunities to apologize for anything that we said or did that was hurtful to the person. So let's, let's talk about, well, let me back up for one moment. Um, LEAP is, is focused on developing relationships that result in acceptance of treatment and services. Uh, just like my brother, he never believed he was mentally ill, but he accepted not only treatment, but services, uh, going to a clubhouse um, and, and other services. Uh, SAMHSA uh, uh, chose LEAP to use in their family toolkit, uh, and it's based on a, a, a psychotherapy, but you don't have to be a psychotherapist to use this. This is a communication approach. And I'd like you to imagine the tool belt with seven empty communication tools. Um, the, 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 the LEAP acronym and the DOA acronym, uh, those, those seven tools are gonna go into your tool belt. And by the way, you might think that DOA is an unfortunate acronym, but I actually believe, and as do many of us who, who use LEAP, that our relationships are dead on arrival if we're not using one or more of these, of these tools. These are not steps, these are communication tools. So here's some examples of LEAP reflective listening. I mean, you all know how to listen, right? You don't need me to tell you how to listen. But active, non-judgmental, respectful listening requires active, reflective listening. So someone says to me, I don't need any medicine. There's nothing wrong with me. Here's, if I was using LEAP, how I would reflect that back. You're saying you don't need medicine and, th and there's nothing wrong with you, right? Now you'll notice the two bold-faced pieces that kind of make a sandwich. We start with a preface. You're saying, uh, or something like, if I heard you, let me see if I got this right. And then we reflect back what the person said. Uh, we can paraphrase, we don't have to use their exact words. And then we ask them, did you, did I get it right? You know, in other, it's another way of asking the person, do they feel heard? Here's another example. Someone says to me, and, and this comes up a lot in families, I know that you're poisoning me. This is someone who has a delusion that I'm poisoning them. You know, if I heard you, I'm poisoning you. Did I get that right? You can reflect that back. I'm not admitting to poisoning. Uh, I'm being monitored and it's the CIA. Well, what I'm hearing is the CIA is, is monitoring you, correct? Did I hear you? The CIA is monitoring you? I mean, this is a way we can reflect back. Uh, when you called the police, you know, they abused me and I was wrongfully locked up in the hospital. Here's how I'd reflect that back. So if I heard you, when I called the police, they abused you and, and, and they wrongfully locked you up, right? Did I hear that right? So I can reflect those things back. Am I agreeing with what the person says? I'm not. I'm reflecting back what they've said. If I was agreeing, let's look at that first example. I don't need medicine, there's nothing wrong with me. Agreeing would be, 
saying, you know what, I agree with you. You don't need medicine and there's nothing wrong with you. That's not the example I gave. The example I gave was you're saying you don't need medicine and there's nothing wrong with you, right? So it's very different than agreeing. All of these examples are not agreeing. So we're gonna do another quick role play. We need a couple of volunteers for this one. Elizabeth, I need your help again. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have one volunteer, Anne Marie. Okay. Already ready. Great. All right. I don't see help. her yet. All right. You should there she is. There you go. And do we have another volunteer? Or is Anne Marie our only brave soul out there? Oh, good. King Coke. King Coke? All right, we can work with two folks. That's good. Uh, can you both unmute yourselves and, and turn your cameras on? Would that be all right? Thank you. Am I saying your, am I saying your name correctly, King Coke? Call me KK. KK? KK, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, KK. Mm -hmm. KK and Anne Marie. So here's what I'm going to do I'm going to role play a young man I worked with with schizoaffective disorder who had some delusions and had anisognosia. All you need to do is reflect back what he said. Okay, using leap reflective listening. Okay. Anne Marie, you wanna go first? Cause sure. you're not, you look, you look eager to go. All right, yeah. here we go. Anne Marie, I'm not sick and I don't need these damn medicines. If you wanna help me, you can help me with the people upstairs. Every night they flush the toilet to communicate with the people who are trying to kill me. Fred, what I hear you saying is you're not sick and you hear people flushing and that they want to kill you. Do I hear that correctly? Nice, very nice job, um, but also of reflective listening, but also a really nice job of the common old habits that interfere with reflective listening. One of the first ones is omitting many important things the person said. You actually left out a few things that were really important. Mm -hmm. Let's go to KK and I'm gonna come back to you, okay? okay? Now, people say this is loud and fast and it makes it harder. So I'm gonna slow it down, okay, and go softer. You ready, KK? Mm -hmm. All right, KK, I'm not mentally ill. I don't need these damn medicines. If you could help me with anything and be with the people upstairs, every night they flush the toilet to communicate with people who are trying to kill me. So you are saying that you are not sick, you don't need any medications, and then the people upstairs are flushing the toilet every night in order to communicate with people who are trying to kill you. Is that correct? Very nice job. Like Anne-Marie, you did a really nice job of reflective listening. And like Anne-Marie, you omitted something really important. That was fantastic, thank you. It's important, one of the reasons we do this role play is to uh, reveal some just old habits that we have that, that interfere with pure reflective listening. Now in the real world, you don't have to reflect back every single thing the person says. So all of you and the two of you especially don't misunderstand me. Using LEAP in real life, you might only reflect back what the two of you reflected, okay? But for the purposes of this exercise, I want you to get it all. So Anne-Marie, I'm gonna come back to you, okay? Can I take notes? No, 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 no notes. No, 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 that's cheating. No notes. Okay. Listen. listen with your ear and with your heart, okay? This young man was really upset. Okay, Anne-Marie, I'm not mentally ill. I don't need the damn medicines. If you could help me with anything, be with the people upstairs every night they flush the toilet to communicate with the people who are trying to kill me okay what i'm hearing you say is that you're not ill you don't need medicines and every night you hear the people upstairs flushing the toilet to try to communicate with people they're not trying they are they're not trying they are communicating that are communicating to people that are trying to kill you is that yeah. correct yes Really nice job. In the real world, I'd be really happy with that. 
But in the world of this seminar, you revealed one of the old habits. You're omitting something really important. There's two other habits I'm going to talk about in a minute that get in the way of, of leap reflective listening. But you omitted something. Do you know? Do you have any idea what it was? Maybe his emotion. Nope. Oh. We're going to get to empathy. Okay. Kiki. KK. Sorry. Let's Is do it one more. Don't say what you think was admitted. Let's see if you can do it. Okay. Okay. One more. One more time. Okay. KK. I'm, I'm not mentally ill. I don't need the damn medicine. If you could help me with anything, it'd be with the people upstairs. Every night they flush the toilet to communicate with the people who are trying to kill me. Fred, um, I hear you. And you said that you are not sick and you would not, you don't need to take any medication, but you want my help. You want my help to see what I can do with the people who are flushing the toilet every night upstairs and that you believe that they are communicating with people. I don't believe it. I don't believe it is true. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Stop, stop, stop. This is fantastic because you guys aren't making many mistakes. Um, you slipped into a form of omitting what was said called diminishing, making smaller. Mm -hmm. So the, he, he doesn't believe the people are trying to kill him. He knows they are, right? So saying things like, well, you feel or you believe or you think mm -hmm. ways we distance ourselves from the person. So thank you for revealing that one. That was, that's a really important one. Okay, you said, uh, if I'm gonna paraphrase you, tell me if I, if I heard you correctly. You said, uh, when you were reflecting back, uh, you want my help with the people upstairs, right? It's not actually what he said. You, you're, you, you, you are remembering the thing that you, you both, you and Anne-Marie are missing, but you didn't reflect it back accurately. Let me, can, should I, can I just do it for both of you? Or do you, you want to try it? Do you want to try it, either one of you? No, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys get an A. You just not get an A plus, that's all, which is good. I, I don't want you to get an A plus. I need you to reveal these old common habits. Okay, here's what it would sound like. So I'll, I'll be talking to myself. Javier, let me see if I understood you. Let me make sure I got this right. You're not mentally ill. You don't need the damn medicine. If I could help you with anything, it'd be with those people upstairs who are trying to kill you and they're using the toilet to communicate. Is that right? If I could help you with anything, it would be that. He, he didn't want my help. It was more of a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll say it one more time. And by the way, did you see how I mixed it up? I didn't have to, you don't have to do it exactly the same way. Javier, if I understand you, there's people upstairs trying to kill you. They're using the toilet to communicate. Did I hear that right? And you're, and you're not mentally ill and, and you don't need these medicines. And if, if, if I could help you with anything, it'd be with that, with what's going on. You can mix it up. You don't have to do a linear, you know, step-by-step -step exact thing. In real life, what did I say to him? His name was Matt. Well, I'm going to invent his name as Matt. That's what I call him in the book. Uh, so Matt, if I, if I hear you correctly, let me see if I got this right. You're not mentally ill. You don't need medicine. Uh, your, your major concern sounds like, and tell me if I'm right, because there's people who are trying to kill you upstairs. I just reflected three things back, right? Uh, and I kind of listened with my third ear, my heart, like what seemed to be most important to him. And he needed me to understand he was not mentally ill and that his life was in danger. Thank you so much for volunteering, Anne Marie. Thank you and, so and, much. This you guys are great. Work with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. You guys are great. So just to review um, the common old habits that can that can interfere with leap reflective listening include omitting important things that the person tells us and also diminishing. I was really happy when KK said you believe because that was a good example of diminishing what the person said. Uh, so for example, with Colleen, I, I, I said, you believe you're married to Mike. Uh, that's a way that we separate ourselves from the person. It's not respectful. We also react oftentimes by saying, well, let me see if I can help you or I'd like to, you know, or, or how, do you, how do you know that people are trying to kill you? That's a way that we're reacting instead of reflecting. 
we also sometimes rush to empathy. Now, empathy is really important, but if you lead with an empathic response, like, well, you sound really scared, are you? Um, I've missed an opportunity to join the person where they're at by reflecting back exactly what they've said. Even if they've, if they've said something like, I know that you sexually abused me and that you're trying to kill me. So if I heard you, you know, if I heard you son, you're saying that I sexually abused you, is that right? That I sexually abused you? I mean, you can reflect things like that, even like that back uh, with the goal of having, in this instance that I just uh, shared, the, the, the young man feeling heard and respected. So why do we resist reflecting back many important things our relatives tell us? Uh, we fear we're gonna make it worse, like the delusion that, that something terrible, that we've done something terrible to the person, maybe they have that delusion. We're not gonna make it worse. Delusions are fixed false beliefs or the negative attitudes about treatment. So with this young man that I was portraying, uh, you know, you don't need the damn medicines. Uh, he's got a negative attitude about treatment. He doesn't believe he's ill. I'm not gonna make it worse. We're afraid we're gonna be asked to do something we can't. This young man, after I've reflected back, so you're not mentally ill, you don't need medicine. If I could help you with anything, it'd be those, with those people who are trying to kill you. He said, great, so will you help me by writing a letter saying I'm not mentally ill so I don't get kicked out of my apartment? <laughs> I was working with him on a psychiatric inpatient unit and I diagnosed him with mental illness, so I couldn't write that letter. Um, we were able to get around that. And if we have time for q and I'll, I'll tell you about that if you're interested. Uh, we worry that we're being dishonest. But if you're, if you're being faithful to the LEAP approach, you're not being dishonest. Our emotions can also interfere. We get too frustrated or, or feel defeated or sad about what our loved one is saying to us. And so we react to it. I would never have done that to you. Or I did that because I cared about you. That's why I called the crisis team. Um, that's reacting to, to the person instead of taking the opportunity to reflect back uh, what was said. So what about delaying giving your opinion? So let's say Colleen asks me, let's say I'm working with her. Let's imagine um, a nurse working on the psychiatric unit she's come to for the third time. She hasn't seen Mike or her, her four sons because they're delusions, right? Let's pretend they're delusions. Um, and she says, you know, I hate the medicine. I don't need this medicine and I, and I, and I really hate it. Well, what do you think? You think I should take the medicine? You, so she asked me that, and I'm the nurse working with her. I, would, I wouldn't run right to, yes, I think you really need the medicine, Colleen, because nobody is listening to her about her belief about being married to Mike. So instead, I would delay. I'd say, I promise to answer your question, Colleen. I promise I'll answer your question about whether you should take the medicine. But if it's all right with you, if it's all right with you, I'd like to hear more about why you hate the medicine. Would that be OK? So there's three elements to delaying promise to answer the question. And the last element is ask permission to delay. What's in the middle is getting the person to talk about something that's important to them. Um, let's say she asked me, do you think I'm married to Mike? And I say to her, but I would say, if I didn't want to tell her right away my opinion, I'd say, I'll tell you what I think about whether you're, you're married to Mike. I'd like to keep listening to your views on this because I'm learning things I, I didn't know. Can I tell you later what I think? So I would ask Colleen for permission to tell her later. And I try to get her talking more about this. To delay, I want her to ask me for my opinion more than once, two times, three times, maybe more than that. And I, I, you don't delay so much that you frustrate the person. You delay so that you don't injure the communication, the relationship, and also so the person is asking for our opinion. Notice I didn't use the word but, as in, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, but first, right? And the reason for that is, and you all know this in, in your day-to-day -day conversations with anybody, somebody says, well, I agree with you. I, you know, I think you're right, but, and you know what's coming and, you, and you've stopped listening to them. Uh, so I, I encourage people often to avoid using the word but in the middle of a sentence when you're trying to engage with somebody and communicate with somebody. Here's some quick examples. Um, person asked me if I think they're sick. I promise I'll tell you whether I think you're sick. First, I don't say but, I say first, if it's okay with you, I'd like to hear more about how you ended up in the hospital. 
Would that be okay if I tell you later? I'll answer your question about the CIA. Somebody's delusional about the CIA and they asked me if I, if I believe them. I'll answer your question. First, can I ask you to give me some details about, about what happened the other night when you said they were, they were surveilling you? Would that be okay? Right, same three elements. Promise to answer the question, get the person talking about something re related or unrelated but important to them and ask permission. You've asked me whether I think you're delusional, Colleen asked me that. I promise to answer. Before I tell you what I see, could you tell me more about what happened when you attended that seminar with Dr. Amador? You know, would that be okay? Can I tell you later? I promise to answer your question about whether you should take medicine. Before I do, I want you to know that your opinion about the medicine is far more important than mine. Can, I, can you tell me more and, and I'll, I'll tell you my opinion after? Is your opinion about medicine more important than your loved one's opinion? What do you think? I would argue, and, I, and I'm sure some of you agree with me, that my opinion about the medicine when I'm working with patients, clients, consumers, or when I was working with my, trying to convince my brother to get help, my opinion doesn't, is squat doesn't matter. The opinion that really matters is the opinion of the person we're trying to help. Their opinion about, about treatment, whether it's medicine or other kinds of treatment, will drive their behavior. So their opinion is far more important. And why not respect that and communicate that we know that their opinion is far more important. So remember earlier, I talked about the relationship that can lead to acceptance of treatment. You give your opinion. You do give your opinion, but you do it in a humble way. We apologize. Colleen asked me if, if I think she's married to Mike and has four sons. So I'm finally going to tell her what I think. I want to apologize because my opinion might, might feel hurtful to you, Colleen. And, you know, I could be wrong. I, I don't know everything. I, I do know I don't want to argue with you about this. Um, I don't see that you're married to Mike. Um, but I could be wrong. I'd circle right back to acknowledging my fallibility. I, you know, I could be wrong. I don't see it. That's, that's where I, I fall on this issue. I know I don't want to argue with you because our, you know, our relationship, you know, is, 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 is far more important to me than being right. I don't need to be right about this. Same thing with medication. You know, I want to, I want to apologize. You've asked me whether you should take this antipsychotic medication. And, you know, I could be totally wrong about this. I know I don't want to argue with you. Since you've asked me, I'd like to see you try it. I'd like to see you just give it, give it a try. You know, maybe just for a month since you've asked me. That's what, one of the reasons we delay. We want to be asked and we want to be able to say, since you've asked me my opinion, this is what I think. And I don't want to fight with you about it. Don't get into a debate. A debate gets you nowhere. Uh, enlightening time. <laughs> really fast. So here's some examples. Do you think I should take the medicine? All I know is that I'd like you to take the medicine and maybe I'm crazy for wanting this. That's a way of acknowledging fallibility. Maybe I'm crazy for wanting this. I hope we don't argue about this because there's so much we agree on and I'd rather focus on that. If it's okay with you. You know, when you use LEAP, you may have noticed you ask a lot of questions if it's okay with you. Do you think I'm mentally ill? I think your thoughts and perceptions are different than most people. You know, I don't need to, need to be right. I just want to have a good relationship with you. Now, in this example, I only used two of the A's, right? Um, I gave my opinion and I acknowledged my fallibility. Use one, two, or all three of them. You don't have to use all three of them every time. But the, the, the headline here is that you are giving your opinion with humility, not as an absolute truth. An absolute truth opinion would be, um, since you've asked me, uh, yes, I believe you're mentally ill and you really need to be on medication. Why not say, hey, I'm sorry about my opinion. I think it's going to be hurtful. Uh, I could be wrong. I'd like to see you on the medication. Well, why? I think you do better when you're on it. I could be wrong. Why not give it in a humble way so that it's, an e in, no pun intended, it's an easier pill to swallow you know, the, the, the opinion that we're giving. Um, I remarked that apology was another tool. We can apologize for not sharing the same belief about Mike. 
let's say Colleen and I were working together and she really was delusional uh, or about the person being mentally ill. We can apologize for being disappointing, not giving the person what they want. Um, we sometimes hear from people, why are you repeating everything I say? When somebody learns LEAP, their relative will say, you know, why do you sound like a parrot or a therapist? Um, my, my suggestion is you would, you could say something like, you're right, I'm repeating a lot of things that you're saying because I wanna make sure I understand you. And I'm sorry, if you want, I'll stop doing that. You, know, you, can, you can own the fact that you're using reflective listening, why not? I'm sorry, I've been repeating everything and I just, the reason I'm doing that is because I wanna make sure I understand you. I'll stop if you want me to. Um, we, we really should take the opportunity to apologize for not doing what the person asked us to do or for an involuntary treatment that, that we initiated. Um, you know, if you're taking notes like Anne-Marie was about to, um, I would encourage you to take a note. What else, you know, might I apologize for with my loved one? That would be helpful to him or her to help them heal, heal the relationship that you have with them. We want to empathize, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, empathy is really important, especially feelings that come from delusional beliefs. So feelings like fear of, of um, from paranoia, uh, the feelings that come from anisognosia, the anger, the frustration, the loneliness. Um, you know, if I, if I was in your shoes, I'd feel lonely too. Everybody's telling you you're mentally ill and you're not. Did I hear you right? See, I'm not agreeing with the person, I'm reflecting it back and with what the person wants. And always end empathy, if you're using the LEAP approach, by normalizing their experience. Let me give you some examples of that. Um, but before I do, you know, why these feelings? Because these are the, the feelings that leave people feeling really alone. And Colleen, even in a, in a role play, talked about feeling really alone and, and sad. So here's some examples. Of course I'm scared. They have cameras and bugs everywhere. So here's my empathic response. You know, I'd be scared too. Anyone would be. Now I'm not agreeing with them that I believe there's cameras and bugs everywhere. I'm simply empathizing with them. Now, if, if after I say I'd be scared too, anyone would be the person who asks me, well, do you believe me? Perfect opportunity to delay. I promise I'm gonna answer your question, but before I did, ah, but I, I slipped. Before I do, I promise to answer your question, before I do, can you tell me more about, about the bugs you found last night? Would that be okay? And I ask permission. And then the person may push me and say, no, I wanna know if you believe it's true. You know, I'm really sorry and, and, and I could be wrong. I don't know everything. Um, I don't see the same evidence that you see. One of the things you can say when you're giving your opinion that I find is very powerful is, I wish I saw it the way you see it. I really wish I saw it the way you see it. I wish I, I, I understood this the same way you do because then we wouldn't be far apart and, and I don't wanna argue with you. I'm sick and tired of you saying I'm mentally ill. You sound angry and exhausted because I said you were mentally ill. Yes, did I get that right? All I need is to get married and get a job. I don't need the damn medicine. You sound really frustrated because all you need is, is to get married and, and get a job. And you don't need the medicine. I'd be frustrated too, anybody would be. That's my way of normalizing the experience. I hate these drugs, I'm not sick and I'm angry you're telling me I need them. You sound like you really hate the medicine and resent me for telling you you need them, yeah? You know, I'd be angry too, anyone would be. And then think about saying that to your loved one and the next time they tell you that, they're, they're, that they hate the drugs. I'm pissed that you keep trying to poison me. If I heard you, you're very angry that I'm trying to poison you. Yes? And the person says, yes. I'd say, you know, I'd be pissed too. So are you admitting it? Are you trying to poison me? Promise I'm gonna answer that question. I'm gonna delay now. Before I answer the question, can you, can you tell me? And I would fill the blank in with something that's important for them to talk about. And I'd ask permission. Can I tell you later? No, I wanna know right now. All right, you wanna know if, if I'm poisoning you. Let me start by apologizing. And, and, and this is gonna, I think this is probably gonna upset you. Um, maybe I'm forgetting, maybe I don't, you know, 
I, I certainly don't know everything. Um, I don't believe I'm poisoning you. I, I just don't see it the same way you see it. And I don't want to argue with you about this. Now, it sounds bizarre to, to, to say, give your opinion in that way. Um, but it's, it's working hard to not argue with the person. And, and of course, I'm going to say, I don't believe I'm poisoning you. But I'm not going to say it in a pedantic, absolute way. Like, I would never poison you. I mean, how could you even accuse me of that? Why would you say that to me? That's reacting, that's um, uh, not reflecting back and, and empathizing with the person. What can we agree on? The, the goals and the problems that the person sees uh, and always agree to disagree. What are, what are some examples? Staying out of the hospital. I can agree to work on somebody with that, on that goal, finding a job, having a relationship, uh, agree that we both would like it if we didn't argue so much. Uh, we both agree that having a better relationship with each other is, is, is something that we, we both would want. And those are the goals that we partner on, the goals that you can work on together. If we had a longer period, if this was one of our, um, we have a nonprofit called the Henry Amador Center on anastignosia. In our longer seminars, we have time to practice these, the partnering part, but let me give you the headlines, just some examples. Staying out of the hospital. I'll help you with that. To do that, can we partner on your agreeing to try this medicine for the next month? Finding a job. To help you find a job, I'd like you to, and then we fill in the blank with something we'd like the person to do. Meet with this therapist. What do you think I need that? I, whether you need it or not, um, I don't want to argue with you about it. Um, all I know is I'd like you to do it. Uh, the person, we've been asked for money. I know many of you have been asked for money. Uh, I was asked for money by my brother, Henry, which I was able to utilize to help him accept treatment. I'll give you what, what you need. What I need, and this is what I said to Henry, what I need is for you to accept this injection. Just do it one time, and then we'll talk further about it. That's actually the the conversation I had with my brother so many years ago uh, that resulted in his accepting medication, taking injections for 18 years reliably. I mean, there was much more surrounding this, but that's what we were able to partner on. So listen without judgment or reactions, express empathy for feelings that come from delusions, anastignosia, and what the person wants. Find areas that we can agree on and abandon your goal of getting the person to agree with you that they're mentally ill. If, if that's your goal, then, I mean, you, pardon the expression, go for it. <laughs> but has it been working for you? You know, have you been able to convince your loved one they're mentally ill? Partner on those things that you can actually partner on. And during this whole process, we're delaying giving hurtful and contrary opinions. We're redirecting the person to talk about something else. And we're asking permission to delay. When we do finally give our opinion, we do it with humility. We give our opinion in a way that respects our loved one's point of view, their truth. And we apologize for those acts and interactions that feel disrespectful, hurtful, or disappointing. These are not steps. We mix and match. Remember the tool belt analogy? We, we pull these tools out as we need them. We mix them uh, almost like paint on a palette. And the picture we're trying to paint is of our loved one feeling heard, respected, not strong-armed into accepting treatment, uh, but invited to try something we'd like them to try in terms of treatment. Learning LEAP is just like learning a new language. Practice with, with your loved ones. Uh, if you're in a NAMI support group, practice in the NAMI support group. Um, bring up a difficult conversation, that, that difficult statements that your loved one makes and practice reflective listening and, and empathizing. Practice delaying giving your opinion. Those of you who are bilingual or polylingual, you did not learn to become fluent in, in your second or third language by reading a book and attending a class. You had to immerse yourself with other people who spoke the same language. So learning LEAP is just like learning a foreign language. You, you really do have to, you can't come away from this, this webinar and, and uh, expect yourself to be uh, 
adept at this. You, you really, to do this, in my experience anyway, you need to practice it. I, I'm practicing LEAP all the time uh, with my 17-year-old son who's not mentally ill, but, but also with mentally ill loved ones. Um, general guidelines, what's sort of the overarching principles here? It's absorbing what we've heard instead of reacting to it. So using things like reflective listening and empathy. Then we emotionally connect with the person by empathizing, by apologizing, right? So we absorb what we've heard, we emotionally connect with the person, and then we can start problem solving. We can start finding areas of agreement and partnering on those areas of agreement, introducing the idea that we'd like the person to try something. Use these tools as you need them. I've already talked about that, but it can't be emphasized enough. These are, the, the, these are steps in terms of an overall guideline, but the seven LEAP tools, they're tools. So I wanna thank you um, for uh, taking Sunday, part of your Sunday to, to participate in this. I wanna especially thank uh, Colleen and KK and Anne-Marie. I really appreciate your help. And Elizabeth, what a great job you did uh, moderating this. Um, if you'd like to get uh, more exposure to LEAP, if you haven't already been to the hacenter.org website, it stands for Henry Amador Center. Um, I invite you to go there. Um, uh, you will be asked to support our mission. I, I hope you'll think about that uh, to help other families. Uh, but more important, there are free resources. There's videos there that you can watch, uh, a large number of videos now um, that that um, demonstrate LEAP conversations. So again, thank you very much. It's, it's been a really great pleasure to be here. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn the screen back over to Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Amador. It was such an incredible presentation and thank mm -hmm. you for taking your time on a Sunday to share with us. I know this is so valuable to our communities. And we talk about your book and your strategy all the time in our family support groups. I'm not sure what your schedule allows, but there are a few questions um, if you are open to a little bit of a Q&A. Uh, we can do a little one, yeah, if that's all right. Maybe five minutes, would that be all right? Yeah, that, yeah, that sounds great. Would it be helpful if I read them out? Yes, please. Okay, so the first one is, what if you have a loved one that doesn't want to talk to you at all? How do ah. you want to talk? about what is going on. I get this one a lot uh, and, and, and it's really difficult because here we are talking about a communication strategy and we have somebody who doesn't want to communicate. Um, if they will accept text messages, um, I I, you could use text messages. Um, generally, not all the time, when a loved one uh, doesn't want to talk, not all the time, but generally it's because they're really angry with us. Uh, because we've told them they're mentally ill, because we've told them they need treatment. So um, apologizing for those statements, like I did with my brother Henry, is usually a way to get somebody to, to open up and start talking. So what I said to my brother Henry was, I promise I'm never going to, first of all, I'm really sorry for all the times I told you you had schizophrenia. I'm never going to do it again. And why should you? If you haven't succeeded, why continue to do it? And I'm sorry for all the times I told you you needed medication. I hope you can forgive me. And that opened the door to him talking to me again. So apologize for, for those things that you think might have been really hurtful to your loved one. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. We also have another question asking, can it develop? Can someone originally have believed they were mentally ill and then believe it in the beginning or maybe they were ill once and then off their meds? So is this something that develops and changes? And come and go, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, for the majority of, of people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, anosognosia, the, the insight stays kind of stable. If they don't have it, they continue not to have it for years. But, but that shouldn't make you feel pessimistic. I mean, the whole point of LEAP is how do we engage people in treatment even though they don't believe they're ill. In bipolar disorder, it tends to come and go. So it's a symptom, just like mania can come and go, um, uh, depression can come and go, the anosognosia also comes and goes. So, and, and it, gets, it gets really confusing for, for families because we think, oh, she understands she's, she's mentally ill. She's, She's depressed now and she's talking about the manic episode and she understands it. And then a week or a month later, she says there's nothing wrong with her. 
So don't get confused by that. It's a, it's a symptom like other symptoms that can come and go. Yeah, that's something we talk about a lot in our educational classes. It's really, you know, recovery isn't linear, so that. No, it's not, it's not. We what you look for is an overall positive trajectory, <laughs> but it goes up and down along the way, yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question. So in the listening phase, what if your loved one goes on and on and on, ruminating about the same thing over and over? How do you move to the next step? the next step of empathizing. Empathize. Yeah. Well, empathizing. You, you just, you, you do it along, along the way. You, you mix the two together. So um, there's a family I'm working with where the son keeps saying, you know, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really pissed off. I'm tired of all this mental health stuff. And you're always putting me in mental health programs. And, and I've been teaching the family to reflect that back and to empathize. You're really angry with us and you're really upset and we can see why you're upset. So you can empathize and reflectively listen at the same time. You mix, mix them together. Um, and if the person continues to go on and on and on, you may eventually have to, and this is not leap per se, but it's something that facilitates a leap conversation. You may have to draw a boundary and say, you, you would apologize. I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna stop talking because I, I kind of feel like I've heard you. I hope you feel heard. And this, we're kind of going round and round. So I'm gonna, I'm going to hang up the phone right now. We can talk. We can talk again later. Or if it's in person, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to step out and 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 I'm really sorry, but I, I I can't. But I'm really sorry. I can't keep talking about this. Right now, later we can talk again. I think we have time for another question. Yes, we have one. Someone asking. So if someone does become aware of their mental health uh, conditions, but they still refuse help. Do you have any recommendations for that? Um, like Sharon said at the beginning, uh, make friends with, with that person. If it's an adult child, you know, as a parent, I'm a parent of an adult child and my daughter doesn't need me to be the parent I was when she was a little girl. Uh, she needs me to be her father who's a friend. Befriend your family member. So that means take an interest in their perspective. Um, uh, uh, through that friendship, you can start to suggest that they try treatment. But before you get there, I, I, I want to understand why you don't like it, why you don't want to do it. And, I, and, and then you convey your respect for that. Oh, I can see why you don't want it. I can see it. the side effects are really bothering you. You know what? I'd have a hard time with doing that too. You know, it's, it's, it, it's called the change paradox in cognitive psychology. When we stop arguing with the person, fighting, we stop, we end up moving with them. So when we say things like, you know, I wouldn't want to take the medicine too. Now, now I get it. So are you agreeing with me? Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. I'd like you to try it. But you understand why I don't want to try it. Oh yeah, I do understand. You asked me what I think. So this is what I think. That idea of moving with the person, I think is so, so important. Yeah. And such a, this was such an amazing uh, workshop. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and put your um, website info in the chat for all of our participants to check out the Henry Amador Center. And um, thank you. Yeah, go, to, go to free resources is the tab to find the videos. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone awesome. to, for coming out to our wellness weekend. Check out our other events that are happening throughout the month of May and have a great rest of your weekend. And thanks to my NAMI family. You guys are family to me. You feel the same way. We're so lucky to have you. Thank you.